G'day everyone, welcome to the uh, webinar series. Today's topic is on tunnel and basement waterproofing. Uh, we by default have everyone on mute. So if you'd like to ask a question or jump in with something, uh, you're welcome to do so. Uh, just have to unmute your voice to be able to do that. There is another option, which is our, the chat box that you might be able to see there on your settings. So just um, if you want to type in a question, you can type it to me or you can type a comment to everyone. Feel free to use that uh, during the presentation as well. And just to let you all know that this meeting will be recorded. So um, if that's not acceptable to you, obviously you might need to might need to move on. So we will be recording, which means that I think your questions and your, your chat questions will also come through and then we'll be posting those on our website. So that's just to, um, to let you know. So thank you very much for, for joining us. Uh, this is the Bluey Isolation Series, we're calling it, uh, giving us something to do while we're stuck in our homes or isolated in our workplace. We're hoping to bring you a, an educational series uh, on specialised materials relating to civil engineering applications in our area of expertise. So starting off with today, we're going to talk about uh, waterproofing. So Australia hasn't always produced the driest tunnels. I mean, this has been an evolving uh, industry over a couple of decades. Uh, our first big infrastructure tunnels were built in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and I think the Burnley Tunnel in Melbourne, some of you will be familiar with it, back in around 2000, was a real turning point for the industry. Uh, they had quite a few issues uh, with the, the waterproofing detailing and design, uh, other issues in, in terms of being tanked and drained structures. Uh, and it ended up resulting in a lot of delays to the project, uh, quite a few problems in terms of water infiltration, uh, quite poor press, strong community outcry, and cost the contractors quite a bit of money um, in the process. Uh, I think that was a real turning point for us. And since then, th there's been a real um, change in the industry and the approach to waterproofing. It's seen as an engineering um, trade now. And, um, and the expertise is often called for, for for challenging projects. And in the 20 years since, Australia has really become a leading example in the field of tunnel waterproofing. We've turned it around completely, which is great. So why do we need dry tunnels? Um, first of all, I mean, it's a really clear visual indicator of poor workmanship when you have bad leaks in an underground structure. It's something very obvious um, and, and even to the, non-engineering person walking through and using it, they can really see when there's water coming through that there's something wrong. Um, it, it can cause damage to the rep reputation of the asset owner because of that. And there's also usage and shutdown implications. So obviously, you know, you have to have shutdowns to, to do injection and um, other types of remedial measures. There's also the long-term cost of rectification and maintenance. So you have to drain the water out, um, pumping systems, uh, obviously the environmental effect, the treatment of that water uh, in disposing it. Uh, so there is a real long-term cost to, to water leakage. And there's also the asset user perception of safety. So, you know, a lot of people in an underground structure just don't feel comfortable seeing water coming in. They, they're aware they're below the harbour, they're aware they're beho below a river, uh, well underground. They see that water coming in and it can cause some, some anxiety. So there's typically two types of, of tunnels when it comes to, to waterproofing classification. Uh, you have drain tunnels where you have a limited hydrostatic head, so it might be limited uh, so that it doesn't increase above, say, one metre of, of water head above. The drainage um, is provided around the circumference and it's typically allowed to drain out of the bottom into a drainage system where it's taken away. You can see in the photo there, a dimple drain system which was used on the Epping and Chatswood rail line uh, back in the early 2000s. It was about 400,000 square metres of drain tunnel. Um, on that project. So the drainage medium is designed to allow full inflow practically uh, for the duration of the life of the structure. Whereas a tank tunnel is allowed to develop full hydrostatic head. Being tanked, it's sealed all the way around and we limit the amount of water that can, um, that can come into the tunnel. So they're typically the two different types. Obviously, as you can appreciate, it would result in different design between tanked and drained. Tanked has to withstand a lot more pressure, so the structure has to be built differently. Um, so you'll have reinforced concrete, other things to deal with. So two very different types of, of tunnel building there. Around the world, Australia doesn't have a standard for, for tunneling, tunnel waterproofing and, and basement waterproofing. So we refer to international standards. And around the world, 
There are a range of standards that get referred to. There's the British Tunneling Standard, which is fairly lightweight on details, but gives us some information that we can refer to. Uh, there's BS8102, which we're seeing a lot more of recently. That's more a building code rather than a tunneling code, but it does cover the classification of dryness very well, but typically doesn't tell you how to get there, which is one of the shortcomings of that code. And it really is made, uh, it's been written around smaller structures, not, not large civil infrastructure structures. Um, the other types uh, of standards that you see, uh, Melbourne Metro at the moment, and a lot of the projects in Australia are now referring to the OBV tunnel waterproofing standard, which is an Austrian standard. It does actually have a lot of detail in there about the types of membrane, thickness of membrane spacing, water stops, and the type of information you would need to detail and design a tunnel. Uh, but some interesting stuff in there, which can be a little bit contradictory. The, the standard we've referred to most over the last 20 years has been the German railway standard. Uh, we find that provides really good clear guidance uh, on all of the details you need for waterproofing. So that's a range of standards that can be referred to. There's many, many other standards up there. The Swiss have these uh, that are listed on your screen now. There are US standards, French standards, a uh, whole range. And a lot of them interact um, with each other and repeat a lot of the basic information. But that's a, a rough overview of where we're at in Australia in terms of using standards. And hopefully we'll see a standard here in Australia before not too long, something that I think ATS are working on. So getting into the basics of, of waterproofing, it first starts with surface uh, acceptance of your shotcrete or your rock layer. So it's important not to have sharp protrusions uh, sticking out of your rock because obviously that can damage the, the membrane. Uh, you don't want excess undulations or irregularities in the surface. And we use a couple of things for that. So when we're doing an inspection, we want to make sure that and in the design as well, that the, uh, the bends and the curves and the transitions don't have anything more less than a 200 millimeter radius. So you wanna keep that radius on the corners uh, as big as possible for internal and external um, curvature. We also refer to what we call the five to one rule, and that's putting a straight edge over the surface, say a meter long. And then from that meter long straight edge, you would measure off that, and you wouldn't have more than a 200 millimeter deviation, for example. So that's our five to one rule. We also recommend nothing more than 10 millimetre uh, aggregate size. So they're the, the high level things we look for uh, when we're inspecting chocolate and the type of expectations we have. Obviously, there's a lot more detail that goes into that, but that just gives a, um, a broad overview. These are the types of substrates that you would look at and deem unacceptable. So we have large drops, transitions, fallout in chocolate, roughness that might not be acceptable. So these are the sorts of things we'd be looking at at an inspection. Once you've got your surface inspected and, and signed off, then you'd be looking at applying a geotextile layer. So the geotextile is a, a fabric, uh, typically either 500 grams per square metre or 700 grams per square metre. Uh, it provides protection to the membrane from the sub substrate, so it's just a another layer in between. 100% uh, non-woven polypropylene. We use polypropylene because it's res resistant in an alkaline environment, which is obviously what you have when you have uh, it in contact with concrete. Uh, and it provides a drainage path where you have a drain tunnel, for example. So a few features there of a geotextile, and that's the reason why it gets installed before the membrane. We'll then go and fix rondelles uh, to the surface. The rondelles are those plastic discs that you can see in the smaller photo there. And that's designed so that you don't have to put a nail through your membrane to fix it to the wall. I mean, clearly, if you're designing something that needs to be watertight, the last thing you want is holes through it. So we, we install these discs, we nail them to the geotextile and then we heat weld the membrane uh, to the disc and that's how it's fixed. And they can range in quantities from one per square metre in an invert up to five per square metre overhead. It's really important that the nails are not in contact with the membrane for a couple of reasons. One, obviously when you're pouring your concrete, uh, that nail could puncture the membrane, but also the nails get hot while you're doing the heat welding. So you don't want that nail to damage the membrane behind. When you're installing, uh, the rondelles, it's really important to have a good system and sequence in place so that you don't have a domino failure. So what could happen is one part of the membrane comes down and puts additional weight on the next layer of the membrane and that comes down and that comes down. And you can see, you know, in, in situations it's happened previously where hundreds of metres of, of membrane come down and have to be reinstalled. So there are things the guys will do um, by providing breaks in the membrane, uh, additional security and other things to make sure that that doesn't happen uh, on the site. Two types of membrane, and I think this will probably be a topic for another presentation later down the track, just how you select the different types. But just uh, 
headline on, on the two uh, types, PVC and BLVP. PVCs are a little bit more flexible, easier to install, uh, not as secure as a VLDP system, but still a very good membrane system. VLDP, on the other hand, is a lot more robust. It's a tougher membrane. Uh, it's suitable for highly complex shapes. And the reason is that it can actually be extrusion welded as well. So you're not just relying on hand welds, which we'll talk about in a, in a moment. Uh, so that gives you a lot more security on a tunnel where water tightness is a lot more critical. So when you're installing the membrane, there's a few important things that need to be considered. The membrane has to be installed with some slack in it. And you can see in that photo there what we call quilting, which is the membrane just looping a little as it goes along the length of the tunnel to provide enough slack so that when the concrete is poured, it can actually push back to the surface without uh, putting tension into it. So that slack is really important. The guys, when they're welding and installing it, will go in and push the membrane at different points just to make sure that they've allowed for enough. You don't want to allow for too much because you don't want folding in the membrane uh, when the concrete is pouring. So it's a really neat balancing act in making sure that you install your membrane well and quite a, quite a skill to achieving that. Successful welding, no matter what type of welding it is, whether it's extrusion, hand welding or double welding, relies on three key factors for a, a successful weld. It's the temperature that's applied to the membrane. It's the pressure that you apply and the time that that's applied for. And those three things in combination will result in a successful weld if those settings are right. Um, we do that for automated double seam welds, hand welds and extrusion welds, which we'll give you a bit more detail on now. So a double seam weld, I think the, the best photo there for describing how it works is the bottom left hand photo with the machine. You've got the two rollers there which show how the pressure in the second photo can be applied to the two layers of membrane at two points with an air gap in between. So you end up with two 15 millimetre parallel uh, weld seams. Uh, you end up with very reliable and consistent results because it's all machine operated. So you set the temperature on the machine, you set the speed of the machine and you set the pressure. So you can be assured that all of those three key elements are being applied correctly for the entire length. Um, of the world. And for that reason, this is the preferred welding technique because of that reliability, but also because you've got the ability to be able to test the air channel afterwards. And when you look at this photo here, that top photo shows that air channel and the bottom two photos show how we can test that air channel. So we pressurize it. We make sure that we don't get a pressure drop. In this case, 20%, less than 20% after 10 minutes, we do a two bar pressure test in accordance with standard. And, and this makes it really reliable. So we test every single weld that we do, and, and this is um, required by, by most standards anyway. Um, so you test every weld as you go. So it makes it a really reliable way of, of welding. The other type of weld is a hand weld. So this is where you have more complex shapes, uh, three-way three curvature, other things to deal with as you're going along. It's used for repairs. Uh, and you've seen those three photos down the side there. There's a hot air gun. Um, pressure being applied at first by a finger and then it becomes applied with that roller. And the pressure is being applied by hand with the roller, the heat um, and the speed is all being managed by person, which obviously it's a good weld, but there's uh, the possibility that something can go wrong with that type of weld. And that, that's the way you hand weld um, PVC where you can't use a, a double seam welder. Whereas with VLDP, you can then come in over the top and you can place the third type of weld which which is an extrusion weld. So after you've completed that hand weld, you come in with an extrusion gun, which you can see in the photo there. Uh, and you that top photo shows the extruded molten HDPE over the top of that hand weld, creating an extra layer of security and a double seam. So then your hand welds also become double seam welds, which give you that extra layer of security, which is why we like to use VLDPE uh, in situations where you have tank structures and, and high um, consequences of failing. So we also do on sites what we call a peel test. Um, and this is a, a machine for doing it, an extensiometer. Uh, this tests the weld parameters. You want the weld to be stronger than the membrane itself. 
So you can see that piece of membrane going into, into tension there will actually test that the weld doesn't fail. Um, that's usually done on a, a regular basis uh, throughout the day of welding. Every time the, the weld parameters change, a, a new test might be done. It can be done with an extensiometer or it can be done by hand as well. The important thing is that the weld is stronger than the, um, the membrane. There's also the possibility to do vacuum box tests. Uh, they're not as common in tunneling because you're usually not dealing with flat surfaces, but you can apply the box over a flat surface, create a negative pressure, and you can check for leakages. So this can be done on, on, on flat surfaces, just another type of, of testing that is available and usually limited for localised testing on very specific items, maybe where a repair is done, for example. So moving into detailing of the, of the membrane, uh, first of all, we have rear guard water stops. So these are used for internal compartmentalisation. I'll explain what that means in a moment. Uh, for stop end protection, where you have formwork and you're worried about the formwork coming in contact with the membrane, we can put, and we usually do put, water stops at every construction joint for tank structures. Uh, and these are fully welded to the primary membrane. So it's fully sealed uh, to the membrane. And we create compartments with these water stops. So the compartments act to stop water traveling from one area to another area between the membrane and the concrete. So if in 20 years time, someone comes and drills a hole straight through your structure and that compartment starts leaking, then that water won't be able to travel. You can see in that bottom diagram there, how the water stop creates a longer water path and prevents water from getting to the uh, construction joint. You can see in the photo there, uh, very heavy compartmentalization on a structure which has been broken down into smaller compartments because of the number of pores uh, that are being done. So obviously a lot of security there. And that then classifies the membrane as partially bonded in this case. So we have a bonded, unbonded and partially bonded membrane. These would be partially bonded. We also use injection hoses. So injection hoses are used at locations where there's a high risk of, of leakage. Uh, these allow resin to permeate a joint in an area without having to drill afterwards. We can use acrylics and polyurethane resins to inject. Uh, we like to put them at construction joints in tunneling uh, between pores. Really good to, to have these included in your structure. Even as a backup, they're a low cost item, really good insurance policy, good to have in place in case the structure moves or somebody comes along and makes a change in the future that will require um, some remediation waterproofing to be done. Obviously important to have an anchorage system as well, because quite often you have to fix through to the rock to support different elements. Uh, and if you're fixing through, then you want to make sure that the membrane isn't compromised in that process. So we have a few different types of anchors uh, that we can use. So we have what we call a BA anchor and that BA anchor um, just there in that top photo doesn't hold as much load. So around 20 kilonewtons compared to a GRP anchor, which can hold in excess of 200 kilonewtons. But both systems are sealed all of the way through. And you can see in the little drawing there that the membrane is welded to the flange of that anchor. And then it's sealed all the way around the fixing. And then that entire BA anchor is uh, resin anchored into the rock or the shotcrete surface. So it creates a fully sealed system that then you can fix reinforcement to, uh, you can fix formwork to, and other elements. The GRP anchors are typically made for holding up much heavier items, um, either large formwork systems or vent fans or other things that require the, the high load. So just moving on to termination. So everywhere your membrane ends, you're going to need to terminate it. Uh, with an effective seal. And there's a few ways of achieving that. In underground structures where there's high pressure, we, we tend to uh, go for the, the pressure gasket. Um, there's also an alternative to use an epoxy termination, but we'll talk about the pressure gaskets first. So the pressure terminations are engineered sealing systems. So the pressure in the gasket is designed to be two times the maximum amount of water pressure that you're trying to resist. Okay, so that can actually be calculated um, and, and worked out. We use a couple of things. We use finite element analysis modeling for the plate. And we have a model that we use for the rubber gasket, which takes into consideration the hardness of the gasket, the thickness of the gasket, and the type of pressure that you're trying to resist. So in a typical design, as you can see on your screen at the moment, for an 80 meter design, you might have a 10 millimeter thick steel plate, which is 100 millimeters wide. 
your gasket will be 12 millimeters thick with a Shore A hardness of 50 to 65, which is quite a firm rubber um, when you see that. And we compress that down to around 50% and we achieve negligible leakage with that. We've done a lot of testing on it. Um, we've tested it up to 80 meters of, of waterhead without any leakage. And we know that technically it'll work well beyond that as well. Those pressure gaskets are then used in a range of situations. So I'll just go back a slide or two. So that first photo that you can see there is a TBM tunnel where you have the TBM concrete segments, which have been opened up for a cross passage. And then we've terminated the membrane around the opening to connect in with the gaskets on the TBM segments. So that's one reason why you would need to terminate membrane is, is that a TBM cross passage. Going forward, uh, pile terminations are another way um, that these pressure gaskets can be used. Uh, really important part of designing uh, basement structures, um, shafts and the like where you have uplift, so you have the tension piles. Those tension piles are broken down to uh, invert level and then we put an epoxy capping across the top and we do a compression seal all the way around and that membrane is connected and you have a fully sealed system. So a really effective way of sealing pile terminations. You also have epoxy terminations which can be made. Obviously anyone who knows anything about epoxy knows that you probably need a fairly dry environment to be able to use this. It doesn't tolerate any movement of the substrate so that's why we typically don't use them on TBM cross passages because any movement of those cross passage um, of the TBM segments could result in cracking and probably will result in cracking of that epoxy. So we'd rather use a pressure termination in that situation to tolerate the movement. But the epoxy termination can be used in other areas. We like using it on diaphragm walls, for example, where there's limited movement. As long as the diaphragm walls are, are dry enough, it's faster to apply, it's lower cost, and doesn't give too bad an outcome as long as we've got it used in the right circumstances. Another little challenge we come across is terminating DCP anchors. So these are commonly used for uplift. Um, hasn't really been a way of sealing these up until the last couple of years. So by using a VLDPE membrane, we can actually weld that to the HDPE sheathing. And the way we weld that is through a number of stages so that we can test it the whole way along. And if you look on that top photo, so first of all, we weld a flange, if you like, around the, um, around the sheathing, which is a flat section. Then we air pressure to test that to make sure that the weld top and bottom is, is fully sealed. So that's a fully pressurized system. We know it's sealed. That top photo, you can walk away knowing that that's um, successful welding. And then from there, we create the boot, which you can see in the bottom photo, which comes up and connects to that flat section. And then that boot connects to the membrane below and we can air pressure test that um, as well. So we know then that we're walking away with a fully sealed um, pressure resistant uh, system, which connects to the DCP anchors. So dewatering is another consideration, often gets overlooked um, during the design stage. So particularly when you're uh, installing membrane on a tank structure, water may be coming in from the rock and water will build up pressure behind the membrane. So you have to have a way of draining that water while the membrane is installed and through to the concrete being placed and poured because you don't want that bulging uh, behind the concrete. So we have a number of ways of doing it. This is just one way you can see in the photo, which is by using a steel flange, which can then be capped off because the biggest consideration after this is all done is how do we cap off the system after we've used it for dewatering. So there's a lot of different ways um, of doing it. Uh, you can do it with a steel, you can do it with plastic, you can do it with welded systems, um, but it is something that needs to be considered during the design stage to allow that water to, to relieve. So just finishing up with some of the uh, construction considerations that can be overlooked um, during the detailing and some of the surprises that kind of pop up at the last moment that you have to try and deal with. Uh, one is formwork fixings. So almost in all cases of, of membrane installation, there has to be an allowance somewhere along the line to be able to install formwork and that formwork needs to fix through to the structure to support it. And we need to consider how that will be done either without damaging the membrane or in a way that the membrane can then be adequately repaired after the, the fixings are taken out. Obviously we prefer to use things like BA anchors um, and other fixing mechanisms so that um, we don't compromise the membrane uh, during the fixing of the, um, of the formwork. And also 
we have to protect the um, the membrane as well from the formwork. And in circumstances where you have uplift of the formwork, this becomes particularly important. So you can see the, the shape of these two tunnels here where they're curved and they come down to the bottom. So the formwork actually becomes buoyant during the um, casting process. And that buoyancy force can be extremely large. So that force has to be resisted. There's usually pads at the top of the formwork, which will hold it down and those pads are supported against the membrane. So that obviously has to be designed well so that it doesn't damage the membrane um, as well. Storage of materials and not just the membrane, but also steel reinforcement and other things. So the trades that come in after um, the, the water thing is installed. So the membrane will need to be protected with a blinding layer or some sort of mechanism for ensuring that the membrane doesn't get, um, get damaged during the process. Fire safety uh, is a consideration. Uh, tunnels are reasonably confined in terms of their space, access and egress. Uh, so obviously it needs to be a consideration during the construction process when you have, could have hundreds of metres of tunnel with membrane installed to the surface. You obviously want a membrane that meets certain flammability requirements. Uh, and you also don't want it to release toxic gases uh, while it's burning. Uh, storage of the materials becomes really important. You don't want to be stockpiling materials uh, around the membrane. Simple things like um, smoking, lighting fires, um, uh, welding around the membrane all need to be considered. So you have to have adequate safety protection measures in place to ensure that that membrane uh, um, doesn't catch a light during the process. And then on projects previously where we know we've had to install long lengths of membrane, we've actually allowed fire breaks. So we do short lengths of the tunnel, fire break, short length of tunnel, fire break. We control the storage of our materials, control the storage of flammable liquids, and obviously um, smoking and other things are controlled as well. So a few things to consider there. Traffic over the membrane. So depending on the sequencing of work, uh, you may be required to, to traffic over the top, obviously particularly for, for invert membranes. Um, where you have to do a wall or a crown afterwards, or it's the only access for the tunnel. So blinding obviously works well, rubber matting, other things can be used to protect that membrane. Many different types of access for installation of the membrane. Uh, the most simple would be an EWP or basket uh, style arrangement. Um, as you can see in the left photo, the middle photo is probably the more technical and complex type of installation equipment. So this is an automated gantry system. That automated gantry system actually moves around and unrolls the membrane as it's, as it's coming out over. We have both semi-automated and fully automated systems. Uh, so these things can get as technical as you like. Um, on one hand, they can be very flexible, these systems. So if you have changes in tunnel width as you're progressing, so if you're going from three lanes to four lanes, then this type of gantry can be um, flexible in that regard, but it has a limit to its flexibility as well. Uh, so that just needs to be considered depending on the size and shape of the tunnel. And then we have thick scantry, which you can see on the right-hand side here of your screen. Steel fixing uh, during the process. So after the membrane is installed, uh, the concrete is usually reinforced, not always, but usually. Uh, that reinforcement needs to have a way of being fixed uh, to the surface um, through the membrane without com compromising it, obviously. Uh, the BA anchors uh, play an important role in that. Uh, also, things like lattice girders, which we've seen in some previous photos, can be used for fixing the, um, the steel reinforcing cages overhead. Um, probably the, the greater risk here is how the steel is actually handled on site uh, once the membrane is installed. So bundles of steel being dropped and moved around. There's real potential for damage. And one thing I should mention, when you're looking at all these membrane photos, you can see a coloured surface. So in one photo there you see yellow, the other one you see blue. That's a very thin film of membrane on the black membrane behind. That thin film, if anyone um, scuffs the membrane or if it gets damaged in some way, provides a visual indicator that the membrane is thin. So it allows let me, leave, uh, let me leave the other meeting. Sorry, there's someone coming through there. So Sequencing of the work is, is also important. So the membrane doesn't always get installed all in one go. Uh, there may be a capping over the top of it before you can access the wall. It may be part of a roof that needs to be uh, installed before uh, you do the base or the walls. 
um, different sections that can be done at different times, but that sequencing can have a really big impact on how the membrane is detailed. So how you make those connections from one piece, which may be done 12 months in advance, for example, then coming back 12 months later and connecting into that membrane. So it's not just about the lines on the, on the drawing where this membrane goes, but it's also the sequencing of work, which will end up determining um, how we do our install. So some of the construction um, considerations, oh, that was the wrong slide, we've already been through that. Um, just in summary now, and you were coming to the end. So uh, it's important to ensure that you go through all of the design very early uh, in the process. The earlier that you can have engineers involved and thinking about the waterproofing, the, the more chance you have of success. Um, we have engineering solutions that can be provided to create watertight structures. And the small de details really do matter when it comes to managing water infiltration. And it's obviously always the small details that are the hardest to, to focus on, but that's really the, um, the most important part. So that's a little bit of a, a summary on you know, waterproofing basics. I hope that was uh, useful to everyone just on our half an hour mark there. Um, I'm happy to take questions now via chat if anyone has any questions or something that you'd like me to go back to. Um, an alternative, my email address is, is up there for you all to see, so jot that down if you'd like to shoot me an email after this, then, um, then please feel free to do so. So if there's any questions, feel free to chat it or um, look, if, if you want to put yourself off mute and, and ask one verbally, we'll see if we can handle that as well. Okay, looks like we explained everything reasonably well. Uh, no questions there. So I'll just take the opportunity now, just if anyone's writing a question, just to thank everyone for attending. It really does mean a lot to me. We had nearly 70 people on the line uh, today, which I just think is, is amazing. Really, I was hoping for maybe 10 or 15 people to, to drop in and listen to these. And um, I'm, I'm really appreciative that um, the people made their time today. I hope it, it gave you all something a little bit different. And um, I, I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. So Greg um, Cedars from Bluey will be talking about uh, GRP bars tomorrow at 11 o'clock again. Uh, and we'll be doing these little seminars at 11 o'clock every day. So please join in, share the link around, um, let your colleagues know we're more than happy to have as, as many people um, as we possibly can fit in these seminars. So. Thank you again. I'll um I'll bring that to an end now, and um, we look forward to seeing you again again tomorrow.